Good morning, contracting office. Hi, Pat. Yes, I did receive the acquisition requirement package you sent over, and I'm actually going over it right now. I'm trying to understand a few of the documents within the package, particularly the independent government cost estimate, and I would like to discuss it with my contracting officer. Can I call you back once I go over everything and get a better understanding of the documentation? Okay, thanks. I will talk to you soon. Good morning, Jack. I received a call from my customer who wanted to go over the requirement package. I had a few questions first, and I was wondering if you have some time to discuss the Independent Government Cost Estimate, or IGCE. Good morning, Michael. Sure, I have some time. Come on in and have a seat. So, what specifically would you like to discuss relative to the IGCE? Well, as you know, I'm new to contracting, so there are some things I'm still learning. I know the IGCE is the government's independent estimate for the costs associated with the requirement, but I'd like to know a little more. Specifically, I want to know what to look for, such as the elements of the IGCE, how I can assist the customer so they know how to prepare it, and its purpose in the acquisition process. If you can provide some references for me, that will be helpful as well. Of course, I'll go over the IGCE with you. To begin, let's talk about exactly what the IGCE is. The IGCE is the government's independent government cost estimate, developed by the requiring activity, and its purpose is to estimate what it would cost to complete the tasks required or to purchase an item. An IGCE is required for any action over the simplified acquisition threshold. Remind me again, what is the simplified acquisition threshold? The simplified acquisition threshold means a specific dollar value, which is set and defined within FAR 2.101, along with the applicable exceptions. I will make sure to research this up when I get back to my desk. Good. So, when the requiring activity creates the IGCE, they will base their estimate on the requirements within the performance work statement, statement of objectives, statement of work, or the item description. The extent of IGCE documentation may be different for each procurement, but you will want to immediately look for the name or names of the IGCE preparer, that person's approving reviewer, and position title or titles, the preparer and approving reviewer, organization, and contact information to include their telephone number and email. A signature and date, either hand-signed or electronically signed, for the preparer and approving reviewer. A statement certifying that the IGCE was developed independently and prior to seeking any formal offers or proposals from contractors. And a narrative supporting how the IGCE costs and or prices were developed with sufficient analytical support, such as spreadsheet information or a Word document that explains the purpose, scope, IGCE preparer conclusions, and clearly identifies reference material used. The narrative should be in enough detail and scope to allow the contracting officer to understand what analytical procedures the preparer used, how supporting information was considered and applied, and the preparer's conclusions. Okay. I will make a checklist for these items. What do the cost or prices in the IGCE consist of? And how does the requiring activity provide the basis in the preparation of the IGCE? In other words, where does all this pricing information come from in order for the requiring activity to come up with their estimate? Well, first you need to understand that the IGCE may either be at the price level or at the cost level, depending on the requirement. Wait, let me stop you here to ask what is the difference? The difference lies in the type of information and detail involved. Price level information looks at the bottom line price of an item, or a service, and not at the individual cost elements. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I want to purchase a car. 
price level information looks at the price that I will pay for the car. I would look at the sticker price and maybe get the prices of the same car from other dealerships or the prices of other similar cars and compare those prices to determine what price I am willing to pay. Those other prices would be considered price level information if I was creating an IGCE. In buying a car, I do not need to know how much the individual component parts cost or what kind of labor went into the production of the car. Then, there's cost level information. Cost level information looks at all of the cost elements required in making an item or performing a service. This information will include labor categories, hours, labor rates, overheads, profit, materials, subcontracts, and all other cost elements. Situations where an IGCE at cost level is needed include sole source procurements, anytime we anticipate a cost type of contract, or anytime where we need to do a cost analysis to understand and determine whether the proposed prices are supportable. Okay, I think I understand the difference. What should I look for when I get an IGCE either with cost information or price information? For commercial supplies and some commercial services, the requiring activity will most likely determine the market value of an item or service on market pricing from the results of their market research. The requiring activity may use resources such as general service administration schedules. Computer Hardware Enterprise Software Solutions Vendor Pricing for Information Technology Hardware or Equipment Published Price Lists for the General Public from Individual Companies Catalog Pricing and Comparisons from Same or Similar Items This is the most appropriate way to estimate what is the true value of an item. Of course, the requiring activity must also consider adjustments for inflation when appropriate as the price of an item can change over time. When the requiring activity is gathering price level information, they may ask our office to provide information on research for pricing information. The contracting office should have a lot of this information already available. For price information, the IGCE documentation may include prices and quotes, such as published or current catalog prices, market surveys, and other sources of pricing information, previous prices and quantity purchased, analytical methods used to calculate prices, and quantity of items to purchase. IGCEs at cost level provide a breakdown of all costs anticipated in the performance of the contract. This should include a breakdown of all cost factors required, including an estimate of labor categories, hours and rates, direct material and supplies, subcontracting, consultant services, general and administrative GNA, expenses, overhead, travel, and profit or fee. Support for this information may come from an engineering or requiring activities bottoms up estimate anticipating the costs estimated for the requirement, historical cost records for previous and or similar contracts, and market research on the particular industry. For my current purchase, it looks like I'm working with a cost level IGCE. Can you help me understand these cost elements in further detail? Sure, let's start with labor. The requiring activity should identify all labor categories required for each task by contract line item number for each year of anticipated effort to include all options over the life of the contract. Also, labor hours are estimated but are divided into productive and non-productive time. Productive time, sometimes called full-time equivalent or FTE, is time the worker spends actually performing their duties. Non-productive time includes paid leave time or paid time off and other potential paid non-productive time, such as breaks, downtime, and training time. IGCEs need to identify the estimated productive and non-productive time. In addition, the requiring activity should also consider Service Contract Act Area Wage Determinations, which usually mandate a minimum amount of time for holidays, 
Normally 10 federal holidays and vacation and personal leave. What about overhead, other direct costs, general and administrative, and profit, as it relates to cost? I want to be sure I understand those areas as well. Of course. Overhead costs are indirect costs related to support of specific operations. There can be overhead as an indirect cost to one or two different cost categories or to multiple different cost categories. For some industries or for some companies, overhead can be associated with the direct costs of labor and or materials only. In other industries or large companies, there may be multiple overhead groups such as engineering overhead, manufacturing overhead, material overhead, field service overhead, and on-site versus off-site overhead. These are just some examples. Overhead is typically expressed as a percentage of the direct cost category it is associated with. The other direct cost or ODC category may include estimates of the types and quantity of material, equipment, and travel estimated to perform the requirements within the PWS. Materials used in direct support of the contract, such as computers, lease of equipment, and vehicles, may also be included within the ODC category. As stated earlier, the IGCE preparer must provide documentation on all estimates and how they were obtained. When considering travel, documentation must also be provided on the number of trips by locations, number of personnel, per diem, airfare, rental cars, and so on. General and administrative, or G&A, costs are any management, financial, or other expenses incurred for the overall operation of business. These costs are distributed equally across all contracts and includes costs such as officers' salaries, officer compensation packages, taxes, accounting fees, legal costs, and so forth. GNA is typically expressed as a percentage of the total costs before profit or fee. Finally, profit or fee is the dollar amount over and above any allowable costs paid to a contractor for performance. The profit or fee percentage will vary due to the projected contract type and other issues. The IGCE preparer and contracting officer should discuss the proposed profit fee structure. Okay, I think I have a better understanding of the IGCE based on our discussion. I appreciate the in-depth information you provided. Not a problem. It is my job to ensure I provide you with the best possible explanation of all contractual topics if you have questions. It's really important that we all understand the importance of the IGCE and how it affects our ability to negotiate effectively as well as determine whether the price or cost being offered is fair and reasonable. I'd also like you to look at the following links and guidance so you can reference it later if you have any additional questions. You may also want to provide this information to Pat so he has all the information he needs when preparing IGCEs for other requirements moving forward. I'm here to answer any other questions if you need me during the process. Thanks, Jack. I will work on this and let you know. Talk to you later.